Thank you, Mr. Hirschberger. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to God's Sabbath services. Brethren, I'm going to start with a question. How much do you know about gravity? You know, I remember when I was just a small boy, I think I was told, what goes up must come down. And gradually, I got a little older. I went to elementary school. And I think I learned a little bit about Sir Isaac Newton and his observations about watching an apple fall from a tree. Well, today, we're going to have some, what, what do they say? We're going to talk about thrills and frills. We're going to start with a thrill. We've got a couple demonstrations today. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to demonstrate what I learned as a little boy. I'm going to come over here to the side of this stage, and I'm going to propel myself into the air, and we'll see what happens. Here I go. Well, good news, brethren. The law of gravity is still in effect. I went up, and I came back down. Well, that's pretty much what I knew about gravity when I was just a little boy. Now, I told you about thrills and frills. Well, that was the thrill, watching me jump up and down. Whoopee. But there's no frills. I don't have a PowerPoint display. I don't even have a chalkboard. So in order to draw a picture for you, I'm just going to use my hands. And so with my hands, I'm going to draw a circle, OK? So if you can just envision the outline of my fingers making a circle, I want you to imagine that everything I knew about gravity when I was a child is contained inside that circle. And the edge, the perimeter formed by my hands, that forms the boundary separating what I knew, what I understand about gravity inside the circle from everything outside the circle that I didn't know about gravity. I mean, I was just a little child. I didn't really know that much, OK? Well, I got older. I went to high school. And eventually, I went to college. And I studied physics. And I learned more about Mr. Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. And I learned that his studies were formally called Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. And what he said in his law was that a particle attracts every other particle in the universe using a force that is directly proportional to the product of those particles' masses. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Wow, that's a mouthful. Let's dissect that a little bit. He talked about masses. Well, we don't talk about mass every day, but mass represents the amount of matter that an object contains. Now, my wife tells me I'm kind of dense sometime. But, but basically, we think of mass a lot of times in terms of weight. But in reality, mass pertains to what's inside. And so an 8-inch cannonball has a lot more mass than, say, a 2-foot beach ball. Because, you know, you're on the beach and you play back and forth with this great big beach ball. It, it's very light. It doesn't weigh very much. It's just full of air, not much mass. But a cannonball, oh, that'd be heavy. And we've seen that in movies where the, the, the sol soldiers and sailors would lug them around and put them down the muzzle of a cannon. OK, it's time for the second thrill. I'm going to do another demonstration, but this one's going to be different. Because over here, I jumped up in the air. Not going to do that again. I'm going to come over here, 
and I'm just going to step off the edge of the step. Now I want you to watch closely to see what happens. Now watch closely. Well, were you watching? I stepped off the step and I went down. It's exactly what Mr. Newton said would happen. What we just saw was an attraction between two particles. There were two particles involved here. I was the first particle. Now, I don't care whatever my wife says, I don't really have that much density to my, my person. I'm not that big a guy, I'm, I'm just, I'm a man. What's the other particle? The Earth this great big planet that we all call home. And it has a lot of mass to it because the Earth is basically a big piece of rock, isn't it? I mean, it must have millions, billions, gajillions more mass to it than I do. And that's why when I stepped off that step, oh, the Earth pulled me right down, right smack down onto the floor. Well, that was part of the theory of gravity. But, he, but Dr. Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, also talked about distance. And he talked about the fact that the further apart those particles are, the weaker that force of attraction is, okay? So when you have particles fairly close, big one's gonna pull that little one right up to it. And that, that's what just happened over here. But if we increase the distance between them, then things start to change. Like an astronaut who goes up in space. Remember, we've seen that on TV and in movies and things. He kind of can float around because he's much, much further away from the Earth. The distance has increased. Okay. Now, this part's really good. Do any, do any of you here recognize the name Henry Cavendish? Anybody? Oh, I, I, I see a yes down here. Gwen remembers Henry Cavendish, but not many of us. Well, I don't want anybody to get mixed up here. Henry Cavendish is a good guy. Don't confuse him with another Cavendish. Bad guy, Butch Cavendish. And, and I know some people may remember bad guy Butch Cavendish because he was an outlaw. He led a pack of ruthless outlaws in the Old West, and they ambushed six Texas Rangers at a canyon called Bryant's Gap. Oh, they ambushed them, killed them, left them for dead. But in reality, only five were dead, and one was still alive. He was the only ranger left, left for dead. But an Indian came along, found him, nursed him back to health, and that Indian's name was Tonto. And so he was the Lone Ranger, and that's where the Lone Ranger got his start. And of course, together, Tonto and the Lone Ranger, they ridded the West of bad guys. And, you know, I mean, well, the rest is, well, it's history or folklore. I mean, the Lone Ranger didn't really exist, as much as I hate to admit it. But bad guy Butch Cavendish, that's, he's different. He's different from Henry Cavendish, because Henry Cavendish really did exist. And there's one more thing. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and, and, and <clears throat> I'm going to continue. Just, this has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon, but I'm going to ask your, your indulgence for just another moment, and this is a happy part. The man who portrayed Butch Cavendish in the Lone Ranger television series way back in the late 1940s or early 1950s. He was played, he was played, portrayed by an actor named Glenn Strange. I don't know if any of you remember him, but he kind of had a little bit of a conversion because he changed his ways and he became a good guy on the screen and he became Sam the bartender at the Long Branch Saloon 
run by Miss Kitty Russell in gun smoke. Now, if Mr. Stiver were here, I'm sure he would have appreciated that. But moreover, I think Dora Richards would too, because I know she was an ardent gun smoke fan. So that, that was just a happy little piece, had nothing to do with the sermon. So thank you for your indulgence. Let's get back on track here. Okay, back to Henry Cavendish, because he really did some important stuff. He wanted to calculate the strength of this force of gravity, because he, he already had Sir Isaac Newton's work behind him. He wanted now to quantify this and calculate how strong it was. So he had a problem, though, because you saw what happened to me over here. When I stepped off that step, the earth pulled me right down. He couldn't get far enough, of the way, far enough away from the earth to be able to do his experiments to measure the force of gravity. So what he did, it was really quite ingenious. He took two iron balls. They were 12 inches in diameter, so, so like cannonballs. And he put them on a wooden stick, six feet long. So they were out here where my, my fists are. And he suspended it from the ceiling on an iron cable. So he balanced it perfectly. So it just hung like, like my arms and my fists are. Then he went and got two more iron balls, but these were much smaller, just two inches in diameter. And he set them up the same way on the end of basically a six-foot broomstick, suspended in the middle by an iron cable, a steel cable. And he had them about nine inches apart. So if you can envision, these would have looked probably something like a barbell that a strong man in the circus might have used years ago. But he had them locked in position with clamps. Then he cut them loose. He relaxed the clamp so that those cables were free to spin. I don't know if any of you mechanics out there ever used a torque wrench. I've heard mechanics talk about a torque wrench being something that they use to measure torque or twist. Well, that's what he did. He had a torsion balance on the top of this cable. And after he released the clamp, what do you suppose happened? That, that barbell that had the, the two little two-inch balls on either end began to rotate and twist because that little ball was drawing closer to the nine-inch ball, which was over here. And of course, it was a success for him. He was able to do his calculations, and he was able to measure the force of gravity. And in his calculations, he came out with a particular constant, a constant number that needed to be used in the calculations. And it was a massive number, 6.64 times 10 to the 11th power. That's a big number. I don't know if we have any, any school teachers out here or anybody that know that's really a big number. What are they going to call a number like that? Well, take a guess. Today it's called Cavendish's constant. Wow. We have covered a lot of ground today about gravity. Let's just update our little picture a minute ago. Remember the one that I drew with my hands? Well, let's think about it. Everything we've discussed here today We've put a lot more knowledge inside our circle. We talked about Sir Isaac Newton and his law of gravitation. We talked about Mr. Cavendish. We talked about the experiment that he did and with, with the torsion balance. And we talked about how those, those balls spun around. And we talked about Cavendish's constant. Now, I wouldn't expect any of you to ever remember Cavendish's constant, but at least you know that it exists. Maybe someday you'll be on a game show or, or you call up the radio and, and they'll say, do you happen to know how they measure gravity? And you'll be able to say, why, with Cavendish's constant, of course, and they'll give you $1,000. Well, I hope so. <laughs> the point is, though, brethren, you've learned a lot today about gravity, and your little circle has gotten a lot bigger because 
it's all full now of all this stuff about Cavendish and Newton and, 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 and all this, this work that was done in order to measure this. Remember what the perimeter of my circle represents, you know, around my arms here? That represents the boundary between what's inside the circle, all that knowledge that we have about gravity, about Newton, about Cavendish, all of that. That's on the inside of the circle. And that represents things that we know. We understand those things. We, we know about them. I mean, we don't have to go out and teach a, a physics class or anything, but we know at least that they exist. But outside the circle out here, that's the stuff we don't know. We don't understand that. I'd have to take more physics classes to learn more about that. But I know that it's out there on the other side of my boundary. Brethren, this is the critical point of today's message. So if, if you've been sleeping or just hoping that I will sit down and shut up soon, I'll tell you for this, just wake up for a minute and try to get this and remember this. The critical point of our message today is the more I learn and understand about any subject, like gravity, if I am truthful and humble enough to admit it, the more I should recognize how very much I do not understand. That's all the stuff out here beyond my little circle. I know what's on the inside, but I don't know what's out there. And as my circle got bigger and bigger and bigger, the perimeter, the boundary around it, separating what I know from what I don't know, that just gets bigger and bigger. And it should make it ever more apparent to me, wow, there's a lot that I really don't know about gravity. I mean, if, if, if the space program needed somebody to get some astronauts home, oh, I would hope they wouldn't call me. I'm sure there's a lot of people that know a lot more that would be able to help. Do you imagine for a minute that this scenario that we've just painted could be true about other subjects too? We've just shown that it was true about gravity. Be because remember, we started out and you, you said you didn't, you didn't know very much about, about Cavendish. Gwen down here, she knew Mr. Cavendish, but nobody else knew anything about that. But now you all know something and your circle of knowledge has increased. Do you think this could be said about any other subject? Absolutely. Could such a subject include God and Jesus Christ? Their truth, their laws, their plan. Well, consider for a moment, who invented the law of gravity? Mr. Newton discovered it. Mr. Cavendish measured it. But God was the one who invented it. You have all been so patient today. You have listened to me for 15 minutes of introduction here today. But finally, you spokesmen, you've been waiting for my SPS, my specific purpose statement. Well, here's the title of the sermon today. Recognize the unknown. Recognize the unknown. Now you may think, oh Scott, this just gets worse and worse. What kind of an oxymoron is that? Well, it's not really an oxymoron it, it, because you might say, well, how can you recognize what you don't know? Well, as we grow and learn more about God, I mean, our circle of knowledge keeps expanding, getting bigger and bigger, we should become more aware that there's so much more out there that we don't understand. Because as our circle of knowledge is getting bigger and bigger, this perimeter around my arms here, that's getting bigger. And we see there's so much more on the other side of the circle, beyond the perimeter, that we don't know, that we don't understand, that hasn't yet been revealed to us. OK, well, I've done all the work up till now. It's your turn now. Let's start, start turning to some scriptures. Let's begin in Job 38. And we're going to read some words that God spoke to Job. Job 38, 
we'll read verses 4 through 7. God asks Job, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? What were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy. Here God questions Job about these things when earth was founded. Well, let's skip ahead a couple chapters to Job 42, and we're going to read the first six verses. Job 42, starting in verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. No purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, things I did not know. Here Job is admitting that he knew very little compared to God. In verse 4, he says, listen, speak, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job finally recognized he truly knew very, very little. And what he did know, what was inside the circle, was very small in comparison to what God knows. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 55, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God states very plainly here, his ways, his thoughts, are much, much higher than those of man. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read something from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 12. Paul says in verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Here Paul says that we currently do not see clearly. We don't see the whole picture, but someday, Someday we will. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians and go back to chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's read verses 2 through 4. Paul writes of this, saying, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Here Paul describes things spoken in heaven, which were beyond man and his ability to, to understand fully and could not be uttered afterwards. Let's turn over to um, some more words from Paul. These in Colossians. Colossians 1 verse 26. Colossians 1 verse 26. Paul speaks of the mystery which has been hidden from the ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to God's saints. God's word was not always, but finally has been revealed to his saints. They didn't understand. They didn't know. They didn't comprehend. But today, God's people can understand his word. 
Let's turn back to Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's read verses 6 through 16. Back to Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now in verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. God's plan for mankind is beyond man's, <clears throat> man's heart to even conceive. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. They're revealed through God's spirit, God's deep things. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. It's spiritually comprehended, and this comprehension comes only from God. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Who truly has known the mind of God? Well, let's go back to Daniel for just a few more verses here. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel was in my Bible the last time I looked. Let's see if we can find him today. Daniel 2, notice verses 28 and 29. Daniel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. God says, I'm sorry, Daniel says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. God is the one who reveals mysteries. Look at what Jesus had to say in the book of Luke, chapter 10. We're going to read verses starting in verse 21. Luke 10, starting in verse 21. In that hour, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Verse 23, and he returned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see these things that you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, to hear what you have heard and have not heard it. Jesus Christ made it plain that he revealed knowledge of the Father to those selected to understand that truth, those who were called, but it had not yet been revealed to them prior to that time. Back in Matthew chapter 13, let's turn to verse 17 and see again what Jesus has to say along these same lines. <clears throat> Matthew 13, verse 17, For assuredly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not, to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus said they were many righteous men who longed to see and hear such things and hadn't. But brethren, it had not yet been the right time prior 
to Christ coming. Let's go back to, um, to Matthew 24 towards the end of the chapter. Matthew 20, 24, and we're going to read verse 36. Notice what Jesus says here. But of the day and the hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Christ told his disciples that some things were still unknown by the angels, by Jesus Christ himself, and were known only by the Father. Brethren, these are all things that are outside the perimeter of our circle of knowledge. They're on the other side of the boundary. They remain in the field of the unknown. We don't know them. There are many items, details, and elements of God's plan which remain in this area, things that we just don't yet know or understand. Let's conclude in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3. For some admonition here from that apostle, 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter admonishes us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Notice his final words of instruction. To grow in grace and knowledge. That's what we're challenged to do. That's why we're here on God's Sabbath, assembling together to learn more about God and his ways. Peter exhorts us to do that, to grow. May our circle of knowledge continue to increase. We're to continue expanding that circle of knowledge about God, about Jesus Christ, and their plan. And as we do, as we see that, that boundary continue to get larger and larger, separating what we know from what we don't, we'll realize how much more we yet have to learn. This, brethren, is why I said what I did. This is what I meant by the statement, recognize the unknown.